Hello, can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes. We are. We can hear you. Okay. And slides are seen. Slides are also seen. Slides are on the uh, okay mode, and we can hear you. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, liver transplant is a big operation, and uh, it was started uh, over 50 years ago by Thomas Tarzel, and it was very difficult at that time. Most of the patients uh, died because of bleeding during surgery itself, and uh, outcomes were obviously not very good. But um, it was some. It was revolutionary procedure in terms of the concept of actually changing a patient's liver so that he becomes well was something which has caught the imagination of uh, of, of doctors and surgeons uh, since uh, since then. But outcomes have improved a lot, and I think it, a lot of it has got to do with um, has got to do with the fact that there have been extensive improvements in uh, in in anesthesia, better understanding of of liver failure, managing uh, uh, the patient during surgery. Uh, obviously, surgical techniques have, have improved remarkably, and there's been a lot of advances in ICU management. So patients who are very sick, who are on multi-organ failure, who, who need multi-organ support, can be managed uh, safely so that they, they make a good recovery. Now, in terms of, uh, uh, of indication of transplant, I think this is the, uh, if there's one message that you take home, then this is a take-home message that, uh, the, there are in, there are lots of indications for liver transplantation, a, a wide variety of indications. But at the bottom line is we only do the operation when the patient needs it. And uh, while liver transplantation is a big operation and it has as well with, with the risk of mortality, uh, so you cannot really use it for anybody who's got cirrhosis or anybody who's got uh, uh, jaundice. So it has to be uh, indicated only for patients who have at least a 10% risk of dying without the operation. So it can be a acute liver failure or chronic liver disease or HCC. Your risk of death without a transplant has to be at least 10%. Now, this 10% number has come from the fact that the accepted one-year survival after liver transplantation is 90%. So, if you're uh, if you die if you're going to the die a chance of dying without a liver transplant is more than 10%, then the benefit of transplantation is more than the risk. I mean, you will actually see that in most of the times when in liver transplant is actually performed. The risk of dying within one year is, is significantly higher than 10 percent. So, uh, liver transplantation is an indication when patients are are with liver related disease are very sick and need a transplant. The second thing is obviously what is the survival? What is the benefit of the operation? I mean, you need to have a survival benefit of more than 90 percent in one year, but you should also have a survival benefit of more than 50 percent at five years, which means. If you transplant 100 patients for a specific indication, then at least 50 of them should be alive after five years in a, in a good condition. Now, this is something that is increasingly being stretched because the basis of why this 50% at five years came up was uh, because in the West, it's primarily disease donor liver transplantation, which means you know the liver is being shared by, uh, will be, can be shared by multiple patients. So they might be patient with hepatocellular carcinoma, they might be patient with alcoholic cirrhosis. They might be patient with uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome. So we 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 can we have to make judicious use of this organ, which actually can be given to anybody because it's a it's a disease donor. Now, in, because to avoid transplanting patients with futile indications like extensive metastatic HCC, this uh, uh, bottom line came up that you should have a survival benefit of at least fifty percent at five years if they are the chance of you surviving after transplantation is, let's say, 30% at five years. Transplantation is not indicated because that organ can be better used to another patient who will have a better survival outcome. So that was the reason why this 50% at five years has come. And this would exclude patients who are terminally ill, who are very old with multiple comorbidities, who have extensive hepatocellular carcinomas where you know, the chance of recurrence or the chance of patient dying with coronary artery disease or any of these things. So these this is a this is a safety measure so that patients don't get transplanted just for the sake of it and that they will have a benefit. Now, with the advent of living donor liver transplantation, this has been slightly changed simply because a living donor transplantation is when a donor, a patient's relative, donates a part of his or her liver to the patient. So this organ is otherwise not available to other patients with other indications. So they, they will be surgeons, physicians who would say, even if this chance of this patient surviving is only 40% at five years uh, with transplantation, why can't we do living donor transplantation? Because 
this organ is otherwise not available. This is a personal gift to this patient. So the patient wants it, the donor wants it, even if the soil is not 50%, we should do it. So this is why indications for hepatocellular carcinoma in the, in the Eastern countries where LDLT is a predominant form of transplantation has been extending. So you're transplanting bigger tumors, probably more aggressive tumors, because even if the chances the patient survives uh, uh, without, uh, at five years is, let's say, 40%, it's still better than not surviving at all. And uh, most people would give the example of, of you know, pancreatic cancer, where uh, a Whipple's procedure might have a five-year survival of 20 to 25%, but still we're going ahead with it. So why not, if you're going to have a 50% survival at five years with HCC for transplantation, even if it's an advanced HCC. But what we need to remember here is that there is a living donor, however well he wants to donate the organ, he, he's at risk of, of complications, of even mortality. So that is something that we need to take into account when we are extending this indication for transplantation um, in the LDLT, uh, living donor liver transplantation scenario. Now, uh, I'll, I'll go through the indication for transplantation. These are, these are very uh, you know, generic slides. So the most common indication for transplantation in adults is end-stage chronic liver disease, which is basically cirrhosis. Uh, the big four indications are obviously alcoholic liver disease, uh, hepatitis B and C, non-alcoholic pseudohepatitis. And then you have these other less common indications, such as autoimmune liver diseases uh, or butt carry syndrome or polycystic liver disease. So when we look at these indications, um, alcoholic liver disease is a big issue in India uh, and across the world. Uh, chronic hepatitis is the indication of transplantation are reducing, especially in hepatitis C, because now we have the direct acting antivirals, which have uh, which, which, which give you a nearly 100% uh, zero conversion rate after hepatitis C. So, in fact, in the last 10 years that uh, I've been in liver transplantation in India itself, the number of transplants hepatitis C are coming down. The number of, uh, uh, of patients who have post hepatitis C transplantation and then have recurrence and graft failure have come down. So now, actually, if you see the most common indications for liver transplantation in adults in India would be alcoholic liver disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That's non-alcoholic pseudohepatitis related to metabolic syndrome like diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease. Now, autoimmune liver disease like primary biliary cirrhosis, uh, cholangitis, primary sclerosing cholangitis, they are more common in the younger population. So the first three indications are usually in the 50s, 60s, and 70 years of age, whereas the autoimmune liver disease are more in the 20s, 30s, and 40 years of age because these, these affect a, a younger population. Now, uh, but carry and policy liver disease obviously are, are much less common uh, indication, but uh, are probably more interesting because of the technical challenges involved in these transplants. When we, uh, now, when do we decide that a patient is chronic liver disease, either because of alcoholic liver disease or because of non-alcohol fatty liver disease? When does the patient need a transplant? Which means there are a lot of patients who have cirrhosis. There are a lot of patients who have chronic liver disease, but all of them don't need transplant. A small percentage only of them would actually have an indication of transplantation. And for that, we need to again look at what is the risk of death without a transplantation. And then there have been many ways of assessing the severity of chronic liver disease that most commonly use the classical one of the child peer score, where you have a list of five or six parameters like ascites, encephalopathy, and based on that, you decide whether the child's A, B, or C. Child C, obviously, is an indication of transplantation. There might be some high child's B patients who might also be from transplantation, but definitely child C, a, trans, a, a patient with child C cirrhosis, unless there is another indication for transplantation, like hepatocellular carcinoma, would not be offered transplantation because, again, the risk of patient dying without a transplant is less than 10% in these patients. Whereas somebody who's got child B, child C, the risk of dying without transplant is more than 10%. So that's how uh, child B can be used for deciding on patients who need transplantation. Now, the, the MEL score is, is a more objective way of assessing the risk. So it uses three variables, uh, the INR, the serum delivery level, and the creatinine. This was a score which was actually developed initially by uh, Dr. Patrick Kamath at Mayo Clinic to look at how well patients with chronic liver disease do after TIPS procedure. So what is the risk of patient decomposing with TIPS? And what they found was as your MEL score grows increases, the risk of the patient having a severe decompensation after TIPS procedure is, is higher. So you can avoid a TIPS procedure in those patients, but the 
the UNOS, the, the, the American uh, ASLD found that this score can actually be used to predict the risk of dying without a transplant. And they've included that in uh, as as a as a marker for assessing the the urgency of needle transplantations in the U.S. So what happens is every patient who's on the waiting list of transplantation, they have a MEL score calculated on a on a on a monthly or a bi-monthly basis, and their priority on the waiting list changes according to their MEL score. So if you if you're becoming sicker, your priority increases, and if you you you're becoming more stable, your priority decreases. So that's the MELD score that's being used in the US. And in the UK also, it has been used for a long time. Now there's a recent modification called UKLD, UK NC liver disease score, which includes uh, a component of, uh, of sodium also as part of the score, uh, because uh, that is supposed to predict uh, mortality better than just a MELD score. And in fact, the recent change in MELD score, which is used in the US also, is MELD with sodium, where the sodium level, so patients who have even if they have a normal bilirubin, they have a normal creatinine, they have a normal INR, they can still have liver disease with ascites and gross fluid overload, fetal edema, extensive edema. And these patients, even though their MEL score is very low, they still have a higher risk of death because of the fluid overload status. And for them, a sodium component, the serum sodium level is a, is a much stronger predictor. That's the reason why, because of lots of studies, they've now included sodium as one of the factors in calculating the latest smell. And once again, that is being currently used to decide priority for transplantation. Now, this is a, um, the graph, which, which is, a, it is a very old study, which shows the risk of dying as your MEL score increases. So a score of around, uh, um, around 13 is what will give you uh, a 90% a, a, a survival. So if, you, if, you, if your score is more than 14, then a liver transplantation would give you better survival than without a liver transplantation. Now, so, so this, is what, this is to summarize. So a male score of more than 14, ascites and sodium. So uh, the, if you look at this graph, you know, even if the patient has the same male score, your sodium is 135, your survival without transplantation is this, this high. As your sodium comes down, your survival decreases without transplantation. So Sodium is also an important component in calculating the risk of dying with the transplantation. That's the reason why the new MEL score also includes sodium. Now, there are other indications for transplantation in chronic liver disease. Patients can have what is called as hepatopulmonary syndrome, where there is abnormal shunting of blood within the lungs. So the, the, oxygen, the blood doesn't get oxygenated. So these patients, even if they have MEL score is low, they are hypoxic. They can have cyanosis, they develop clubbing, and they have an increased risk of death without transplantation. So for them, Hepatopulmonary syndrome is an indicator of transplantation, irrespective of the MEL score, as long as they have chronic liver disease. The second component is PPH, which is portopulmonary hypertension. Here again, this is a problem because of excessive cytokine uh, levels in the blood, because the detoxification function of, of the liver is affected in cirrhosis. So what happens is there is intense vasoconstriction of the pulmonary capillary bed, because of which your pulmonary hypertension happens. And this is related to the presence of portal hypertension. And in these patients, again, the risk of dying without a transplant is very high, even if your MELD score is low. So hepatopulmonary syndrome and, and PPH are also indicated for transplantation in patients with chronic liver disease. There are, there are a lot of other indications for, for liver transplantation, which have now come up because liver transplantation no success, is so successful. So at a point, at one point, we were thinking, okay, we should only do it if there's no other option for this patient. But now we know that you know, most centers would have uh, a 90 day survival of, of more than 90 to 95% and a one year survival of more than 90%. So in, these, in, in such an instance, the other factors which, which can improve with transplantation are also being considered. So pruritus. We might think, what is there? Why should we do transplantation for just itching? But you have patients with primary biliary colon, and that is where patients' liver function tests will be normal, but they have extreme intense itching, which because of which they can't do their daily work, they can't sleep at night, they are on extensive medications to control itching. And for them, liver transplantation might be the only option. Then you have patients with, again, primary biliary colon, that is, or PSC, who have excessive fatigue or chronic encephalopathy. These patients are all the time they are... Uh, they are drowsy, they are confused, they might not be able to do their normal activity, they can't sleep at night, they keep getting admitted with, uh, with uh, you know, chronic encephalopathy. You know, these patients, even if their MELD score is low, 
because of their lifestyle problems, they might need a transplantation for a better quality of life. So the, I've, I've, that, that is about uh, chronic liver disease per se being an indication of transplantation. Now, in terms of hepatocellular carcinoma, we all know cirrhosis is a risk factor of HCC. In fact, more than 50% of all HCCs develop on a background of cirrhosis. And the risk of developing HCC increases with time. So the longer the patient is cirrhotic, the more, the higher the risk of, of developing HCC. And the indication and the incidence again changes with the underlying liver disease. So a patient with hepatitis C has a 17% incidence of developing HCC in, um, uh, in five years' time, whereas the patient because of alcoholic liver disease has only an 8% risk. But still, all patients who have cirrhosis, the, the basic thing that we need to do is a three-monthly alpha fetoprotein and an ultrasound scan because these patients at some point, they might develop HCC, and the only way that you can try and cure them when they develop HCC is if they're picked up at the earliest stage. And the way to do that is to do a routine screening of these patients with cirrhosis. So any cirrhotic patient should have a three-monthly liver function test, should have a three-monthly alpha fetoprotein level, and should have a three-monthly ultrasound scan. There might be, there are some um, guidelines which is that it should be done at least six monthly, but I think. Uh, definitely in India, it's better to do three monthly scans so that even if they miss one, we can pick it up in the next uh, next sitting. Now, uh, liver transplantation as a treatment for hepatocellular carcinoma is obviously the ideal way of treating it because HCC in the background of cirrhosis are usually multifocal. Even if you have a single large tumor on a scan, you will have multiple small small tumors which might not be picked up in the scan on uh, in the liver itself. So. If you are doing a liver transplant, you're taking out the full liver from the patient, which means you're going to completely remove all, even the smaller tumors from the liver instead of, in, as compared to liver resection. Similarly, it treats the cirrhosis. So the reason why the patient is developing HCC is cirrhosis, and it treats the cirrhosis by replacing the, the liver. It also restores the liver function completely to a normal liver function. So the patient obviously has much better survival than just resection in a cirrhotic background. But the problem was, <clears throat> Selection is a problem. So very early series, in fact, the first few transplants that were done by Thomas Russell were all for patients who had cirrhosis, were at HCC, and they were this large HCC which could not be resected safely, and they decided the transplantation is the best option. But these patients had very low survivals because the tumor would recur very quickly on a background of immunosuppression. So any patient who has a liver transplant needs lifelong immunosuppression. Immunosuppression prevents rejection, but it also prevents the body's uh, function of of dealing with small tumor cells and small tumor mutations. So patients who have immunosuppression are at an increased risk of developing non-hepatic malignancy like skin cancers, but they also have higher risk of developing a recurrence. So patients, um, so the risk of recurrence is actually higher in patients uh, who have liver transplant for large HCC. Now, the earliest paper which looked at having some kind of criteria to choose patients for HCC for transplantation was uh, this paper by Andre Bismuth in Annals of Surgery, where he showed that patients who have a tumor less than three centimeters, they have a 60% three-year survival after transplantation, whereas a patient who has a tumor more than five centimeters has only a 28% survival after transplantation at three years. So what he said was, in comparison to resection, transplantation is better if the tumors are smaller, whereas if the tumors are bigger, there's no difference in benefit with resection or with transplantation. Now, this was further formalized by the Milan criteria, which was published in 1996. This was a small study, I think about 40, 45 patients. But what they showed was that the survival after transplantation for HCC was phenomenal. It was 83% disease for survival at four years. If you have a tumor within the Milan criteria, which would be a single tumor less than five centimeters or up to three tumors, but none of them is less is more than three centimeters. So in such kind of patients, the survival after transplantation, the four-year five-year survival is more than 75 to 85%. Now, imagine a, an abdominal malignancy without you are treating, you're doing a transplant or a surgery, and you have a five-year survival of more than 70%. It's phenomenal. I mean, we do resections for pancreas with an expert survival of of, of 20 to 25%. We do gastric cancer resections when your expected survival is less than 25%, five years survival. But here you have a liver tumor 
which was previously a, a probably a killer diagnosis. Now with transplantation, you can actually offer a five years survival of 75%. And this was probably one of the biggest things that drove patients towards uh, liver transplantation, surgeons towards liver transplantation. Now, over the years, obviously, these tumor, these criteria are very restrictive because you would only get about maybe 10 to 15% of all HCC tumors, a diagnosis would be within Milan criteria. And there have been attempts to expand this criteria to include a larger and larger tumors and to see what is the benefit of transplantation. And this picture tells you what happens. So as your tumor size and as your tumor number increases, so this x-axis is your tumor size the, of the max of the largest tumor. The y-axis is the number of tumors, one, two, three. Your survival gradually decreases. So if your five-year survival is, is, is 75 to 80%, nobody has any questions that this patient needs a transplantation. Now, if your five-year survival is 70 to 75%, that is this purple uh, boxes, even then your survival is better than what your bottom line says, which is a 50% five-year survival. So even in, even then, these patients can. So suppose you have a um, a four cent, uh, you have three tumors or, or three tumors. The largest is four centimeters. Now this is still transplantable, but suppose you have a, a, a eight centimeter tumor. This is outside. Here your survival is 35 to 50% five-year survival, predictive survival. So this is not within the criteria for liver transplantation as would be accepted in the West, which is a 50% five-year survival. But in a living donor setting, we could probably still offer. A patient is having a 40% survival at five years with a, when you transplant for an eight centimeter tumor, the survival is still better than what would be without transplantation at all, where the patient probably expects survival will be 12 months. So in these patients, again, liver transplantation can be considered in special circumstances as long as you're um, you you have a living donor, a family donor who can transplant, uh, who can offer you a, a liver. Now, with the increasing success of liver transplantation, the out and the improving outcomes of liver transplantation, the indications for these uh, tumors has been increasing. Yes, I think, uh, Dr. Srinivas, uh, you are not audible. I thought uh, I am the only person. Uh, is it some problem with, with my internet? Srinivas? Hello? He's not audible, sir. He's not yeah, audible. Dr. Srinivas, not audible. Uh -huh. Those, I, I was just waiting for anybody else to say because I thought, is it my, uh, my thing is, uh, my net is not working. Dr. Srinivas? Sirinivas, yeah, for the last two minutes, you are not audible. Expanding liver transplant tumors, after that, uh, you are not audible. Okay, just means. Uh, and now okay, you are I audible. Got, yeah, yeah. got this thing, Mr. Thank you. Okay. okay. This one, my dear. Can you see, sir? Yeah, yeah. From here, you are. Yeah, you are. Okay, that's fine. So, uh, with the increasing success of transplantation, 
there are more indications for transplantation now. Uh, we are uh, uh, transplanting things which would uh, indications for which we probably would have said no before. But the there are two things which two in the two instances where liver transplantation would usually be contraindicated. One is obviously extra hepatic disease where you have meds outside the liver. There's no point in transplanting for that patient. And macrovascular invasion, which is involving the portal vein or involving the hepatic veins. Now again, this is. Uh, under a lot of uh, um, research right now, there are now instances where if you have a portal vein tumor thrombus in the, let's say, the right posterior, right anterior portal vein, you give radiotherapy, sterilize the tumor thrombus, and then we can do transplantation. But this is all still at the um, investigation stage. Now, but it's still not clear what we would do with uh, like lymph node metastasis. In fact, a lot of HCC, once they grow beyond a particular size, also have lymph nodes. And what we've seen is in patients whom we transplant beyond Milan within UCSF criteria, uh, which is slightly beyond Milan criteria. If the patient has lymph nodes, some of them are PET positive, uh, some of them actually have tumor at time of transplant, and some of the recurrences that we see post-transplant might be actually lymph node masses. So again, lymph nodes uh, metastasis is an issue that we need to look at carefully when we are assessing patient transplantation. Then there are non hitches tumors. Now there's a big sp uh, specialty called transplant oncology itself, which is developing. So where we're looking at liver transplantation as treatment for non hitches tumors. So cholangiocarcinomas, both perihilar and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, are now increasingly seen as uh, indication of transplantation when safely res safe resection is not feasible. So when, where the liver remnant is very small or where the patient has primary sclerosis and cholangitis and develops a cholangiocarcinoma. So liver is diseased, so you can't resect it safely. So these are some indications where cholangiocarcinoma can be an indication for transplantation. Cholerectal liver medicine now is, 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 is really coming in a big way where patients who have liver metastasis, which are not resectable, either because the liver is damaged because of long-term chemotherapy or because the tumor is so bulky that you cannot have safe remnant after resection, and there is no extra hepatic disease. In these patients, liver transplantation is also being considered increasingly. Neuroendocrine metastasis, again, it's been there for a while. Patients who have very bulky neuroendocrine metastasis or functioning tumors where surgery is not, resection is not possible, transplantations have been done. And then we have pediatric liver tumors like heptoblastoma, which I'll go very briefly later. And benign liver tumors, multiple hepatic adenomas, which are having a high risk of bleeding, huge mangiomas, which are actually causing uh, pressure effects, um, polycystic liver disease, where the liver actually becomes so huge that it entire, occupies the entire abdominal cavity, causing breathlessness, continuous pain, repeated infections. So in these patients also, liver transplantation is now being indicated simply because it's become a very safe, a very standardized uh, procedure to be performed. Now, the third indication for liver transplantation is acute liver failure. Now, acute liver failure is a very specific entity. I think the, the most important thing is that there should not be any underlying liver disease. So patients should not have cirrhosis and then become a But if the patient is having no liver problem before and then develops, suddenly develops liver dysfunction, bilip jaundice, encephalopathy, coagulopathy, all within 26 weeks of a previously healthy state, that would be by definition called acute liver failure. And acute liver failure is not just affecting the liver. The problem is as the liver cells die because of whatever insult, it can be drug overdoses like okay. paracetamol over is the most common indication in liver term, uh, in uh, most common acute, 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 liver acute liver failure, again, you were asked your mic was up for about uh, half a minute. Acute liver failure, please uh, go ahead again. Can you hear me now, sir? Yes, yes. Okay, fine. So acute liver failure is the next indication for liver transplantation. Um, now, acute liver failure is when there is significant liver dysfunction on a setting of a normal previous healthy liver. So which means the patient does, should not have any chronic liver disease, but should suddenly develop liver dysfunction. Now, this can be because of lots of reasons. It can be because of some medications such as um, paracetamol overdose, which is a common cause of poisoning in the UK, it can be because of, uh, of use of anti-tuberculous therapy. So pyrazinamide, rifampicin, INS, they're all hepatotoxic drugs. And we do have patients who start on a an ATT and then develop rapid onset of liver, dis liver failure, which is uh, in India. And then we, in South India, especially, you have yellow phosphorus poisoning, which is a big component in uh, radicular poisons. And 
people take it by mistake, people take it because they think it's a quick way of committing suicide. So these are all indicated for causes of acute liver failure. Then you have the classical indication, the acute viral hepatitis B, acute viral hepatitis E or A, where in most of these cases, the patient recovers completely, but some in some patients can be a, a very severe liver failure causing encephalopathy, coagulopathy. And in these patients, it's not just the liver that gets affected. It's a multi-system disorder. So the, the liver cells are literally dying on, a, on an hour-to-hour -hour basis and releasing lots of toxic cytokines into the system, affecting multiple organs. It's like severe acute pancreatitis. So your lungs can get affected with the ARDS. You can have pancreatitis. You have severe encephalopathy. You can have cardiac dysfunction. You can have uh, um, bone marrow failure. You can have severe bone marrow failure as a, as a common day acute liver failure. So it affects multiple systems. These patients are usually become very sick very quickly and need multi-organ support. And in fact, when, when they hit transplant criteria, the time that we have between they hitting transplant criteria and they dying without transplant is in a matter of days, actually. So uh, um, um, patients can actually die within two to three days of becoming encephalopathic in, a, in acute liver failure. And that's the reason why these patients are listed, what is called as a super agent listing, which means in the US and UK, if a patient has acute liver failure and hits the criteria, fits the criteria for liver transplantation, they are put at the top of their nation's list. And usually the patient gets an organ in 24 to 48 hours. So any organ in the country will be shared to, will be given to that patient. A similar system is also available in many states in our country also. In fact, Tamil Nadu, we, are, we have a super agent listing. Uh, any patient who fits the criteria is put on that list. And the first organ in that blood group is allocated to that patient. So this is acute liver failure. Now, there are indications of acute liver failure, um, transplantation. Uh, there are lots of criteria, but the most popular one is the King's College criteria, which has been used for, 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 for the last 20 years now. And these criteria were initially developed for paracetamol poisoning, which I said was the most common in cause of acute liver failure in the UK. But since then, it's also been expanded to acute liver failure uh, because of other causes. But if you look at the criteria, these are all fairly standard criteria. So you have pro-trauma time more than 100 seconds, which means ex extensive coagulopathy. You have uh, encephalopathy. And the longer the duration from jaundice encephalopathy, the worse the prognosis. So patients who, who, who become sick very quickly, who uh, develop jaundice, elevated enzymes, become encephalopathic the next day, these patients actually have a better survival with intensive ICU, ICU care support, as opposed to patients who have been jaundiced for a couple of weeks and then develop encephalopathy. Because in those patients, the chance of liver recovery is much, much lesser. So these are the, I don't want to go into criteria for liver transplant ALF, but I just want to tell you that um, liver transplantation is indicated in some patients with acute liver failure. And in those patients, liver transplantation is life-saving and should be done urgently. And um, most transplant organ uh, allocation systems all over the world have have an option for super agently listing these patients so that they can get a transplant early. Uh, transplant and aspiration. Uh, worldwide, if you see, about 15 to 20% of all transplants performed are in children. Now, the interesting thing with pre-transplant in children is that the etiologies are completely different as expected from adults. The commonest indication forming up to 70 to 80 percent of all transplants in children is biliary atresia, where I'm sure all of you know about biliary atresia. So there is a congenital non-development of, of the biliary tract, both within the liver and outside the liver. So most of these children would have a kasai, a portoentrostomy within the first two to three months of life. And some of them avoid transplantation, but uh, more than 50 percent of all children who are biliary atresia would come to liver transplantation even after a Kasai procedure. Now, other indication would be other polycystic liver diseases like allergic syndrome. Um, uh, you can have liver-based metabolic disorders um, like urea cycle defects or Krigelnagy syndrome, liver tumors, hepatoblastoma, which is uh, uh, the commonest liver tumor in children, has exceptional survival with resection chemotherapy. Uh, survival of, uh, of a cure rate of often more than 90%. But in, in children who have tumors ex involving the whole liver, resection is not feasible. And in those children, liver transplantation is the option. Now, uh, in children 
other than the liver cell failure indications like jaundice and ketlopathy that we talked about in adults, the two other, uh, the one important thing is growth failure. So children with chronic liver disease, they might not die immediately, but they will have constant growth failure. They will not grow as well because either because of, of liver dysfunction, because of port hypertension, because uh, the, their dietary intake is not good enough as they have to follow special diet in patients like urea cycle defects. So in these patients, again, liver transplantation would correct the growth failure, will help them have a normal, healthy life. So actually, liver transplantation in India is, is increasing much more rapidly than in, in the West because uh, there's, there's so many children who have uh, biliary atresia. There's so many children who have... Um, indications for transplantation. And in fact, in our center right now, about 30% of all transplant that we do are for children, starting from somebody, a child who's six years of age, six months of age to children who are up to you know, 14, 15 years old. The indications vary. So in an infant, the indicate the commonest indication would be a biliary atresia or would be a, 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 a urea cycle defect like a citrullinemia where child has recurrent episodes of uh, um, hyperammonemia and coma. Whereas in an older child, a child who's let's say eight years or 10 years, the indication might be more like a Wilson's disease with decompensation or it could be a, uh, the needing needing a combined liver and kidney transplantation for hyperoxyuria, where the kidneys fail because of a metabolic defect in the liver. I think I have, uh, yeah. So uh, this is just very briefly about metabolic liver disease. I think there's another classification which might be more easy to understand. So. So metabolic liver diseases are an important source, indication of liver transplantation. Uh, they are of, of many types, and this is a very broad and simple classification. So these are basically usually a single gene defects, and they can either be completely liver-based or they can be a systemic problem. So in liver-based diseases, it can be where the liver is damaged, for example, Wilson's disease, where there is a problem with copper meta metabolism. So your um, liver gets damaged, liver becomes cirrhotic. You can have neurological symptoms. In them, liver transplant is indicated. You can have where there's no liver injury. So for example, a krieger uh, syndrome where the child cannot conjugate bilirubin. Child will be, will be jaundiced, can have kernicterus, neurological complications. But if you look at the liver, the liver is pristine. It looks like a normal, healthy liver, soft, no nodularity, absolutely fine. But so the liver is not damaged there, but other organs are damaged. The same thing with urea cycle defects, where there is a problem with the um, uh, urea cycle uh, uh, enzymes. So there is a metabolic defect. One gene is, is not there, so the enzyme is not functional. So patient, children accumulate lots of urea, ammonia, causing neurological symptoms, but the liver looks completely normal. So these are the very there's a wide spectrum of metabolic liver disease. It can be uh, a disease, like I said, in hyperoxylia, where there's a gene defect in oxalate metabolism in the liver, because of which there's rapid onset kidney failures. You have oxalate stones in the kidneys, the kidneys fail completely. And in those patients, if you just do a kidney transplant alone, those new kidneys will also completely go off very quickly because the basic defect is in the liver. So in those children or adults, we, we have to do a combined liver and kidney transplantation. So the damaged kidneys are replaced and the liver with the defect enzyme is also replaced by a new liver. Uh, this is very brief about hepatoblastoma. So hepatoblastoma, these are usually very big tumors, but they usually shrink with chemotherapy. Um, uh, there's a pretext uh, staging by COPA where the amount of healthy liver that can be spared after a resection is the basis for the classification into pretext one, two, three, and four. A uh, pretext four is when none of the four sectors of the liver are spared by the tumor. In these cases, you cannot really do a liver resection. The only option is a liver transplant. Another medium liver transplant in these children is when the tumor is not actually that big, but is involving the, the key vascular structures like the hilum. So you cannot actually preserve tumor-free inflow for the liver after a section. Or the hepatic veins where, again, like in this lower scan, where all the three hepatic veins are involved by the tumor and it is not safe to do a resection. In these children, again, liver transplantation gives equal results. You can have a five-year, 10-year survival of more than 90% with liver transplantation in these in this children. Um, I think this is this. So uh, the, uh, coming to evaluating a potential recipient, like, like I said, the two main things that we need to say before we go down this road is, first of all, is the liver transplantation indicated? Which means, 
is the patient's liver disease severe enough that he will do better with the liver transplant than without a liver transplant, whether it is chronic liver disease and a high MEL score, a hepatocellular carcinoma, which cannot be restricted, or a metabolic liver disease, which is causing frequent admissions with hyperammonemic coma. So again, we need to decide that the liver transplantation is indicated in this, in this patient. Then is liver transplantation safe for this patient, which means so we are looking at the liver, we are changing the liver, but what about the patient's heart, the patient's lungs, the patient's brain, uh, the patient has significant coronary artery disease in an adult, or patient has a child has an uncorrectable coron uh, cardiac malformation, where it's unlikely that the child is going to survive long enough, then there's no point in doing a liver transplantation. So this is something that we need to evaluate very carefully. And once you've decided that this patient needs a transplant and this patient liver transplant is safe, we need to look at, is there room for optimizing this patient? Because most of these patients who come to us for transplantation are actually quite sick. They have multiple issues, whether it's in, in the liver itself, sepsis, whether it's nutritional status, all these things need to be looked at. And we need to try and improve them and get them into the best possible condition so that we can proceed with the transplantation. Because transplant is a big operation. Whatever said and done, it's a, it's a very unphysiological procedure to be done on a patient. You're taking out the, the whole of the patient's liver, and for, a, for an hour or so, the patient will not have a liver in the system. And then you're putting a completely new liver, doing lots of anastomosis, and then you're giving them immunosuppression for the rest of their life to prevent the body from rejecting its liver. So it's, a, it's a, an extremely unphysiological procedure. And the patient needs to be in the best possible condition to tolerate this procedure and go on and have a good survival after the procedure. So that's why uh, a recipient assessment is always multidisciplinary. It's not just one surgeon or one hepatologist saying, okay, he needs a transplant, put him on the list and transplant him tomorrow. It doesn't work like that. It has to be a multidisciplinary process. There are lots of uh, uh, places where one person makes a decision and says, okay, he needs a transplant, finish. Just go and go. It's not, it should never be like that. In the UK or in the USA, it's always a team. It's all, it should always be a team which decides whether this patient is a transplant. So it has to be a systemic assessment. It has to be an organ-based assessment. So you cannot decide, a liver transplant surgeon or a liver hepatologist cannot decide whether this heart will stand through a liver transplant operation or whether this patient is, um, is future neurological recovery is going to be uh, good enough to, to indicate a liver transplant. It's something that each specialist has to give their opinion. No, no specialist can say you should not do transplant for this patient, but their opinion should be taken and that should be taken into consideration when we do the final assessment, final discussion. The second key is a psychological assessment. This is obviously very important in patients who are being transplanted for alcoholic liver disease. We have to tell them that they have to stop alcohol. So normally we would not transplant anybody who's been drinking within the last three months. So three months is a usual cutoff for, for patients with chronic liver disease because of alcohol when they are evaluated for transplantation. There are is now increasing literature about the use of transplantation for alcoholic hepatitis, where patient is so sick that he's unlikely to survive for three months without transplantation. So in those patients, there might be exceptions. There might be patients with acute or chronic liver failure, where patient has very, become very sick now, but has never had an opportunity to be abstinent for more than three months. So in those cases, would you consider transplant in, this, in these patients, even though they have not shown to you that they can stop alcohol for at least three months? Again, these are all areas of of controversy, areas of discussion. The next thing is psychological assessment. Liver transplantation is a lifelong commitment of the patient to, to health care. So they need to take medications on time, every day, all the time. They have to come for medical checkups, get blood tests done to look at graft function as and when required. So these are all important things that the patient needs to understand before they commit themselves to a liver transplantation and before that the team decides that this patient can have a liver transplantation and then have a long, have a good outcome. The third thing is, which is being increasingly looked at, is nutritional frailty assessment. I'll just go very briefly about it at, in, at the end. But in terms of system-wise uh, assessment, I think the most important thing is cardiac evaluation. I think this is because cardiac mortality is a big problem perioperatively and also in the late uh, post-operative period. So, for example, if you look at kidney transplantation, the most common cause of death after one year in kidney transplant patients is actually cardiac, myocardial infarction. So, this is something that we need to look at very carefully in liver transplantation. All patients have an ECG. All patients have a standard echo to look at 
Egyptian fraction to look at you know any regional wall motion abnormality to look at SS a portal pulmonary hypertension to look at PPH to look at valvular heart disease and all recipients will have a dogmatic stress report to look at the function of the liver function of the heart how effective it is in dealing with stress because like I said a liver transplant is a very stressful procedure for the patient now there are some patients in whom we might have to do a bit more additional assessment. So uh, we do, uh, in again, it's it based on center to center. The different centers have different protocols. At, at, at Glenigan's Global, we do a coronary angiogram for any uh, recipient who is aged over 60 or whose BMI is over 30, has diabetes or hypertension or coronary artery disease, or has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease as an indication for transplantation. In all these patients, we do not just do a stress echo. We also do a coronary angiogram because you do pick up a lot of coronary artery disease in these patients. And in such patients, we have to do preoperative optimization, either coronary artery stenting, or some patients might need a coronary artery bypass drafting before we do a transplant. Some patients might have a um, might have a valvular problem. They might need a, 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 a mitral volvotomy, or they might need a TAVI for aortic stenosis before we do transplantation safely. Uh, one thing I wanted to uh, highlight here was the need for assessing the fluid overload status. A lot of these patients, when they come for the echo initially, they have high right heart pressures, but that's probably because they're a lot fluid overload. They have extensive pre edema, they have ascites, um, their kidney function is not very good. So that needs to be assessed carefully. A lot of these patients would be on diuretics to bring down the fluid overload. Some of them might need right heart catheterization to differentiate simple fluid overload, which can be corrected with transplantation, and severe portopulmonary hypertension, which is a contraindicated liver transplantation. So again, um, uh, this is one of the studies that we might have to do in, in selected patients. Pulmonary evaluation, again, an X-ray chest is standard. Pulmonary function tests are norm are standard. We all we always do a, a, a blood gas room air on, uh, on room air, arterial blood gas, to look at the oxygenation. And if our cutoff is, if the PO2 is less than 80 milliliters mercury, they all have a bubble echo. A bubble echo is to look for <clears throat> syndrome. So in this procedure, what they do is they do a standard echo, then they inject uh, agitated saline, which has small air bubbles into the vein, and then they look for um, these, these bubbles coming in the left side of the heart. So if there is no bubbles coming to the left side of the heart, there's no shunt, which is good. If there's a bubble, which are, if the bubbles are coming immediately within the first two or three cardiac cycles into the left side, which means there's a right to left shunt, but if these bubbles come after five to six cycles, then it means there's a shunt outside the heart, and that's usually in the lungs. So that's the diagnostic feature for a hepatopulmonary syndrome. So if the hepatopulmonary syndrome is there, that needs to be diagnosed. We need to evaluate that carefully to make sure that you know it is something that is not too high a risk for these patients. Other systems, like I said, renal function is commonly impaired in these patients because. Um, Liver itself can affect the kidney, called hepatorenal syndrome. These patients might be on high diuretics to deal with ascites that can affect the kidneys, can cause increased creatinine. And thirdly, patients with non-alcoholic non pseudo so fatty liver disease, they have diabetes, so they can have diabetic nephropathy. So, and they can also have recurrent infections because the immunity of these patients is affected by liver disease, which means there are multiple reasons why these patients can have kidney injury. So we need to identify the presence of kidney injury. We need to identify what is the cause of the kidney injury. And then we might have to treat it before uh, you know we can do a transplant for these patients. The rest is all uh, standard. All of them get uh, evaluation to rule out any focus of sepsis in their, in their teeth, in their sinuses. Um, <clears throat> uh, all women have a pap smear to make sure there's no cervical neoplasia. And all of them have a psychiatrist or psychology consultant again to look at about uh, whether they're going to be off alcohol, whether they, they will take medications regularly, whether they'll keep up medical appointments. So all of them have counseling and an assessment. And if the psychologist or psychiatrist feels that this patient has been uh, drinking alcohol for many years, he's unlikely to stop. He's been in yeah, he's um, he's been in detox for a number of years. It's unlikely that you know this patient has stopped drinking alcohol. Then this is not the kind of patient where that we should we should transplant because ultimately the liver will get affected by the, by the by alcohol intake after transplantation. Um, I mean, this is uh, just a couple of slides about uh, about frailty, which is 
most of these patients are um, quite frail, which means their muscle mass is reduced, their physical activity levels are reduced, and uh, there's now an increasing uh, interest in, in, in objectively assessing this frailty. We've all seen patients, you know, senior doctors who look at a patient and say, say this patient is, is too unfit for surgery, whether it's, you know, it's a cholestomy or it's a liver procedure, he's, he's too unfit, he can't walk, he can't manage daily activities, so we cannot do an operation for him. Obviously, that's a, there is a subjective element to this, whereas now there are more attempts to try and uh, um, measure frailty using scoring systems and using imaging to look at the amount of muscle mass that is there in these patients, which is now a new term called sarcopenia, where patients who have sarcopenia who have less muscle mass, they are likely to do poorly after transplantation. So this is, again, these are all things that we are looking at, To but none of these are still contraindication to liver transplantation, but these can be indicate. These can be part of the multiple factors that we need to look at when we decide whether transplantation is going to be beneficial for this patient. Or not. So, um, the final slide, the last slide. Like most of this has already been discussed in the in the talk. So we need to identify issues that we can optimize in this patient before we transplant. So. If this patient has sepsis, a lot of these male, especially male patients with encephalitis, they have recurrent UTI. So we need to treat that. Do they have a, a prostatic hyperplasia, which is causing this uh, UTI? So do we need to treat that? Then, you know, what is the nutrition state of this patient? They're all malnourished because they can't eat because of ascites, abdomen is distended, the appetite is gone, poor hypertension. So your bowel is congested. So you don't have the appetite. So we need to change, do the dietary modifications to improve the nutrition status. Acute kidney injury, we we'll have to treat the cause of the acute kidney injury. Uh, albumin and is what is used for renal syndrome. Cardiac disease, if they have a coronary artery disease, that needs to be treated. So either stenting or CABG or valve repairs. And obviously patients who have limited respiratory uh, um, uh, function, they need, that needs to be improved by either chest physiotherapy or uh, chest toilet. So, so that's that's my talk. I mean, I've, I've tried to cover as much as possible. Uh, so I would have missed out a lot of important things. Uh, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions if um, if uh, any are there. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Sirinivas, and uh, it was a eye-opening. I must say, uh, eye-opening talk, and so many issues you have covered. It's uh, um, I I am I am stunned actually. I am so happy that we organized this uh, this particular uh, talk, and uh, I would uh, I would think that our resident might ask many questions. Maybe maybe they are not uh, that geared up for the transplant, but actually, the so many things have been covered in terms of physiology, human physiology. So there are so many questions which can be can can be asked. Um, I, I request you to share your uh, uh, share your video video share because uh, tomorrow when you come to PGI, so how they will uh, recognize you? So, so <laughs> if if is not a problem, please share the video. Then we can have a questions. I was I I let let's let's start the ball rolling <laughs> regarding the alcohol uh, alcoholic disease and. Uh, uh, in 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 uh, in Kerlinska, I, I thought they had some scoring system, the psychiatric scoring system by which they could uh, think that this patient is not going to drink in, in uh, coming six months. And uh, if that was so, then only they will transplant. I don't know your comment about that. And then uh, please, uh, other 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 uh, friends, colleagues, and uh, uh, residents, anybody have any query, Dr. Sinvas will be very happy to answer. As you have seen. Dr. Bikas very rightly said that his uh, introduction would be his uh, talk. So we are, yeah. So welcome, uh, uh, welcome to you in your uh, in your uh, alma mater. So I am also you. trying to share my video. <laughs> so uh, can you see me? Sir? Yes, yes. Now I can see you. Yeah, welcome. Okay. So thanks, uh, thanks, Dr. Srinivas, and uh, again, thanks thank once again. For the, thank you for the opportunity. It's an honor for me, actually. It's an absolute no, honor for me to. Actually, actually, see, you, you all, yeah, you know that uh, we know how how you have worked in this area, and uh, I, I, as I said, I'm not trying to be modest, but it was coverage of the 
not only liver whole human physiology and uh, it was very very wonderful talk dr ashish yes you can uh, dr ashish please share so dr vikas you also can share then uh, uh, as i said we are very lucky that you are in this field up to this extent and uh, with your help you can do much better so the 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 talk is now open for the question and comments comments please uh, can i can i make a comment okay adu so you don't need my permission <laughs> yeah <laughs> so okay. nice talk shrinivas in fact uh, in the i mean uh, there is lot of uh, uh, i mean concerns now with the uh, levels of uh, alpha fetoprotein while transplanting uh, hcc the metrotica 2 criteria which has come up recently about 3 4 years back they take metro, uh, alpha fetoprotein into account before deciding this uh, whether the patient is suitable for transplantation or not and secondly about the melt score i mean this is more relevant where we have largely a cadaveric program like here what what we see in india is more more of a live donor program so if you have a donor you get transplanted if you uh, early if you don't have a donor you don't get transplanted early so i mean for listing the patient melt is a very good tool but again in indian scenario in uh, particularly maybe it's a good it's a a uh, well developed program in uh, tamil nadu but uh, in north india still we are struggling uh, so much for the cadaveric donations so that is my comment no okay vikas i think the two things uh, i think that that is what you saying is the big problem i think whether it's ddlt or ldlt it's irrelevant you do a transplant only when the patient is likely to die without a transplant so meld of 13 14 is an, is an indication of transplantation whether it's ldl just because you have a living donor doesn't mean you do a transplant because the patient has cirrhosis no no i am not contesting on the indication of uh, doing a transplantation at least uh, until or unless the patient has got good amount of decompensation he should not be transplanted let the patient earn the procedure not uh, we should not force force our procedure upon him so Absolutely. what I, what i am talking is about the logistics of uh, uh, using meld in our scenario in particularly in our, in Even even the LDLT setting, if a patient meld is less than thirteen, doesn't have HCC or any other criteria, yeah. even if they have donor, no nobody we will not transplant. No, nobody will tra transplant below thirteen. That it has to be more than fourteen, and or yeah. some some other condition should be there. Yeah, and I think and, uh, one 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 more thing, Shrinivas. I mean, like uh, one uh, th th there is uh, I mean meld meld score basically it's more of a dynamic process. it will keep on changing from time to time and uh, as you correctly said that sodium meld is a better predictor and because most of these patients sodium levels get varied uh, quite frequently so what i think is we should while uh, putting these patient we should take the worst meld into account rather than the current meld so these patient should be evaluated on periodic basis to calculate the meld score from uh, meld score from time to time but where while they are list they while being being listed their uh, worst man should also be taken into account what, what what what's your comment on this no no see uh, if the patient's mel goes up to more than 14 and uh, we, you know let's say with optimization <coughs> you know your creatinine is 1.5 and it comes down to 1.2 and you now your mel is 11 or 12 that's still an indication because the patient has had hepatorenal syndrome Which has pushed up the creatinine, so that's an indication of transplantation. Yeah. What so that is that is because so absolute figure of thirteen should not be this thing. Uh, I mean, uh, single value. It should be the worst worst med score should also be taken into account because many times we pay, see the patients they have at uh, presentation the med is something like eighteen, nineteen, and we give some treatment. The cytis gets controlled. Sodium uh, improves. improves and then uh, uh, kidney i mean creatinine improves and then melt goes back to 12 or 13 i mean so those should be transplanted i agree correct, correct. okay i'm still uh, uh, i was i think there was a excellent overview I'm so i'm got uh, confused here so supposing somebody has an infection his melt goes high you you take care of the infection part of it and the melt again settles to around 10 so should you transplant this patient because his melt was once At twenty, or should you wait because he's now stable at ten? 
Okay. So if a patient has been having a mild score of, let's say, 9 or 10 for a long time, and he has a UTI, and his, uh, you know, his, uh, his billy went up a bit, his creatinine went up a bit, and his mild has gone to 16. You treat the UTI, and the patient comes back to mild of 10. The patient doesn't need a transplant right away. You just have to follow them. But if the patient is having fluctuating mild, so patient is having recurrent episodes of infection, patient has had a HRS, patient has had a, a spontaneous bacterial peritonitis because of which mild went up, and then it's come down. Studies have shown that the survival benefit of transplant. So even if you have one episode of proven SBP, the risk of mortality at, at, at one year is more than 20%. So in those patients, if you have one episode of SBP and the patient comes back to have a mild of 10 or 11, still transplant is indicated. But if it's a UTI, because of which patient is, or let's say the patient is having a mild of 8 or 9, he goes on an alcoholic binge, ideally, I mean, it shouldn't, and then his billy goes up. He stops drinking, it comes down. You shouldn't transplant those people. What Vikas is saying, just because you see one reading of a male less than 13, doesn't mean you deny transplant for him. What we need to look at is, is the overall picture of the patient. I think that's what, that's what we do. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. And another important thing, which uh, I think you didn't touch, I mean, because of the lack of time was acute ACLD, basically, acute and chronic liver disease. And there the criteria for transplantation, CLIF score, and those things should be taken into account. Absolutely. I think ACLF is a very evolving picture. I think you need to check. Yeah, it's, day it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very big topic in itself. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's we can sometime we can topic. discuss it sometime later in uh, this uh, series of these lectures. And it's a very interesting and challenging topic actually. That's why you want yeah. to go into it. So yeah. There was an interesting book you mentioned about hyperoxaluria as an implication for transplant. So do you do a sequential transplant or you do a simultaneously in this situation or is it still a gray area? Uh, I think uh, see, the, the concept is is that uh, patient who develops renal failure is in dialysis because hyperoxaluria has huge amounts of oxalate deposited in the bones. So one, if we do a, a kidney and liver together, the new kidney will be damaged by the existing oxalate because of which this can get damaged. So ideally it would be a sequential, which means what we normally do, suppose if it's a living room setting and it's uh, two different donors, we do liver transplant first, do aggressive diabetes, with the oxalate levels, and then the kidney transplant. But in practice, if a child, we're doing a single donor is donating the left lobe of the liver and the kidney, then we don't have that option. So then what we do is we do a simultaneous kidney transplant. If the cadaver donor is doing both the kidney and liver, again, then we don't have the luxury in the sequence. Then we do a combined liver. But on the liver, Mute your mics. Many of you have uh, already your mic is on and that's disturbed. Please mute your mic where Dr. Srinivas or anybody else is saying. So just uh, uh, unmute your mic when you are saying something and please mute when you are listening. Anyone of you, please. Dr. Ashish, was I clear? I mean, did I, did, was I clear? Yeah, so I missed the last part. So if even if you're with the cadaver kidney, so you're doing, so you do the liver first, you wait for a few hours or you just do the both together like? I don't think few hours matters. It's always, uh, I mean, simultaneous liver kidney, we always do the liver first and then we do the kidney after that. It's not a question of few hours. It's basically whether we have a time interval of a few weeks to remove excess oxalate from the system before we put the new kidney in. We wouldn't have the luxury if it's a cadaver donor donating both the liver and kidney, or if it's a single living donor donating the right lobe, the left lobe and the kidney. I mean, we do we 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 don't do a simultaneous right lobe and kidney donation because we think the risk is too high for the donor. But left lateral segment donation and the kidney we have done uh, from a single donor. So in those cases, we do a simultaneous. But if it's two different donors, we can have a time gap between to take out the excess also. Yeah, thank you. I think these hyperoxaluria patients, they are not very old. I mean, they're young uh, uh, people only. And then most of them, most of them will, uh, will be, I mean, uh, left left lateral or left lobe will be sufficient for them. And it's Correct. always better, I mean, to have two donors rather than taking left liver and kidney from a single donor. 
that is what i personally feel but i yeah. i know there is literature where both the donations have been done people have done. i mean it is it is about uh, safety and and uh, options if you have two donors uh, you know donating one donating liver and kidney then obviously each donor will be safe but might not not have two donors in the family uh, i mean there might be a, there might be an immunological benefit of taking kidney and liver from the same donor uh actually we've done once where we have taken the liver from the left lobe from a donor and then high dialyze the patient the, the patient after liver transplant and then we done a kidney donation to the same patient after 6 weeks so i mean any combination is possible ultimately we need to decide about what is the safest for the patient and for the donors i think uh, so that's something that that's very flexible actually in the living donor setting in disease donor setting you have a shot you have a kidney and liver you have to do both together and uh, do you use this liver as a dominant transplant like the liver for a patient who has hyperoxalosis so you take out the liver and use for somebody who's got a end stage uh, no, like a hepatocellular no, carcinoma no, no hyperoxalosis livers we are not recommended to be used as do- dominant transplant they can, because they can cause accelerated uh, kidney injury in the new recipient so there are very few indications where you would use an organ as a dominant transplant one of them is uh, uh, fap which is a form of um, amyloidosis where there is neurological damage because of the liver over a long time so in those livers have been used as a dominant hyperoxaluria liver is not recommended to be used as a dominant liver transplant well, another what, indication for uh, this thing domino will be msud yeah that's true correct yeah. Yeah, yeah. MSUD, even uh, in fact, um, uh, most of these um, uh, what are they called? Uh, metabolic liver disease patients, uh, non-serotic metabolic liver things can be done. It won't be a pure domino. It will be what is called an auxiliary domino. I mean, we published this a few years ago. So where a, a child might be having Krigler-Nagel syndrome, and 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 another child might be having, let's say, uh, urea cycle defect. you take a part of liver from that child and put it in this child with krigler-nagel so the krigler-nagel liver will give the enzyme for the uh, urea cycle defect and the urea cycle defect liver will give the enzyme for the krigler-nagel liver so it will be like a uh, auxiliary domino but uh, as a domino per se msud might not be the best option because they can have the again problem and last is that how uh, how frequently do you monitor for immunological uh, uh markers like in kidney we are very particular so supposing you got a husband donating to a wife with multiple pregnancies or multiple transfusions so are you doing any antibody testing uh, prior to the in, uh, prior to listing or just ignoring it no doctor we we i mean as a, as a general rule we don't do uh, antibody testing for liver transplantation whether it's in the disease donor setting or the liver living donor setting um there is some literature about you know relevance of of a big mismatch in hla or pre pre preformed antibodies affecting graft function but um the literature is is lit, is not not a lot and uh, um liver has the ability to absorb lots of antibodies so unlike a kidney liver can absorb a lot in fact uh, in in in, in patients with re, with, with who need a kidney transplant with you know high levels of pra they have actually done uh, uh, an auxiliary liver and a kidney because that small liver that's transplanted absorbs lot of these antibodies and prevents kidney damage so that way liver is is immunologically it's safer i think one interesting thing the only interest only thing that where it might be relevant is in patients who where a father is or a mother is donating to the child there is a very specific form of hla mismatch called one side full uh, full house match where you know let's say the the father is uh, the um, uh, is homozygous for all the for all the three hlas and then it gets transplanted then there's increased risk of graft versus host disease in these children but again that's a very specific thing you know it's just an academic interest but something that's very interesting as the way it works but otherwise we don't usually do <laughs> and what is your uh, antibiotic uh, policy after the liver transplant as a routine what antibiotics do you use antibiotics i mean all of them get piperacillin tazobactam 
for the first uh, 72 hours, sometimes to five days. Um, everybody gets flu console for the first uh, one month. Um, high risk transplants, like patients who had repeated admissions or who have been colonized, they, they might get uh, meropenem. Um, uh, and uh, patients who have uh, ABO incompatible transplants, patients who have um, uh, ACLF acute liver failure, we give them extended fungal prophylaxis with uh, amphotericin. That's the, that's the standard product. I mean, obviously, small, small changes between patients might be there, but this is the general uh, protocol. Even in a disease donor setting, like a patient donor in ICU with multi extended stay, so do you upgrade the antibiotics or still carry with the piperacillin tazobactam? Uh, normally, we do piperacillin tazobactam only. Occasionally, it might be, you know, patient has had been ICU for a while or there is some episode of, of sepsis in the, in the donor, then we might give meropenem. But, I mean, I think last year, disease donor transplant had become so uncommon in, I think I've always, almost forgotten how to Forgotten the the details, but this is uh, this. We yeah, I I agree with what you say. If the donor has been in ICU for a long time, and you know it had been on ventilator for a week or ten days, there is an increase in infection, so we might have to give a broader antibiotic uh, uh, spare um, policy than for the LDLPs. And last question, like technically uh, ALF versus CLD. So we, what do you think is more challenging? In terms of technical and the post op course, so obviously post op course probably would be worse for ALF. Yeah, I think technically ALF would be considered more straightforward because there is no cirrhosis, there is no portal hypertension. For the implantation, when see the CLD, the advantage is patient has been having portal hypertension for a long time, so patient has lots of problems. So clamp the portal, you take the liver out, and let it open up, so the bowel doesn't get congested. CLD patient. In an acute liver failure patient, if there are no collaterals, the minute you clamp your portal vein, the whole bowel gets congested. You start having mesenteric hemorrhages. So there is an element of, of, uh, of urgency in implanting a liver in an acute liver failure patient. Whereas in a chronic liver failure patient, you can uh, you can uh, you know take your time because there is there is no not the condition because there are collaterals. So acute liver failure patient, what we normally do is we feel that the condition is going to be quite bad. Then we do a temporary portocaval sheet when we take the liver out. While we prepare the liver, we back we do the back table work on the liver. We prepare the cave off implantation. The portocaval shunt is there, which decompresses the system completely. And then we implant the liver on the cave. -off. And before we do the portal vein osmosis, we take down the shunt, we close the cave cavotomy, and then we do the portal vein osmosis. So that way, you are shortening the time of portal clamp significantly with acute liver failure. Obviously, chronic liver disease has its own problems. You have a huge liver, you have a huge caudate, it's wrapping the cava, you know. Um, so that, that can have its own problem. But I think this is this would be of interest to surgeons. That, you know, you need to do things a bit more quickly in acute liver failure. Implantation per se. The so thing. Dr. Shinivas, what is your policy? I mean, uh, I mean, we are going a little off the track since Dr. Ashish has raised about the technical issues. So, what is your policy for implantation with the keva? Do you always prefer to cross clamp the keva, or you you do it with uh, only side clamping of the keva? This is DDLT or LDLT? Because? Talking of LDLT, DDLT, so we need to we need to cross clamp the keva. Uh, in in the in the LDLT setting, I don't remember cross clamping the keva so far. We always use side, side biting clamps. In the DDLT setting, we only cross clamp the cable if we are doing cable replacement. Otherwise, we always put a side clamp. Never, I mean, very, very uncommon that we have to cross clamp the cable. And because I was seeing this uh, Dr. Soyan's group, they were routinely putting a cross clamp to the keva by both DDLT, no, 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 no. the LDLT, yeah. So that is Correct. because I didn't see that practice elsewhere uh, uh, in any other center wherever I've, I've gone. So so they were routinely doing cross clamping and then doing the things. I mean, but I, I, I also personally feel that putting a cross clamp uh, produces a lot of hemo hemodynamic uh, changes in these patients. Yeah. And it's usually not necessary. 
that's what i like i said i mean yeah you know, yeah i i agree with it i agree with it so any other any other query by resident dr harjit is listening that uh, so many i i i saw many people i can see the list and uh, any other query by anybody else any curiosity another another another, yeah. another query from my side dr shrinivas i mean yeah. you did mention about the bud carry as a indication for transplant so i mean what do you uh, how do you uh, do, what technique you follow to reconstruct the venous outflow in bud carry patients okay so actually there's a paper currently under consideration uh, uh, from us so it depends on what type of graft we are using so if it's a, it's a, i mean if it's a ddld full liver there's no question you do a cable replacement um if there's no a, problem in ddld yeah yeah if it's a ldlt if there is a if it's a right lobe graft then we always do a neo cava reconstruction using uh, cadaveric veins or a, a expanded uh, gotex graft for a right lobe graft for a left lobe graft we so, just i mean uh, just yeah. sorry to have interrupt you 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 are happy using a synthetic graft uh, for the outflow yeah yeah because it's very rare to have big uh, large uh, amounts of uh, cadaveric veins now because the numbers have come down la uh, for the last one one and a half years since the covid thing has started okay. previously okay. we used to do what we used to do, do was we either use a cava cadaveric cava if we have or we use a cadaveric th thoracic aorta which we used to retrieve or we would okay. use two iliac veins and do a conjoint uh, venoplasty so two iliac veins are opened up to form a large orifice and then we put that okay. um, uh, but i mean korea has shown uh, very good results with using expanded uh, pdf grafts actually in but care uh, yeah. so, okay Okay. Left lobe graft so, directly onto the uh, onto the right atrial. Uh, yeah, so I mean, this is important that not to use the recipient's uh, uh, hepatic veins for this reconstruction. We need to make a separate opening in the cava and then, uh, I mean, uh, put a interposition, sm interpose small amount of uh, new new hepatic vein for the reconstruction. i mean uh, other thing is you know, it depends on the uh, site of obstruction so what india what yeah. we do is normally the the area around the three hepatic veins is completely fibrosed so because yeah. of which you know there's a lot of thickening and the chance of recurrence of but carry is high so in those patients uh, it's better to excise that part of the cavity and do a neo cava but if suppose there's a problem is within the liver or it's like a single web in the cava that's causing the problem we don't need to replace the cava yeah thank you okay yeah though i think everybody is scared of you nobody is asking yeah. questions no no <laughs> nobody is scared of me uh, so uh, no, still 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 he carries that uh, image shrinivas you still remember <laughs> and that image is still continuing <laughs> <laughs> but it, it it was not uh, never this uh, this was with dr sri nivas we uh, he was with uh, with us uh, in the beginning when i came and then uh, we have a very uh, harmonious relationship <laughs> rather than <laughs> terror relation <laughs> no we are we are not contesting was, upon the I harmony was, I, was, <laughs> i was getting my sir established i had no uh, courage to be terror <laughs> that time <laughs> created terror i could remember correctly so i think it was a uh, it was a very nice and technical aspect dr sinivas you can take uh, uh, later on i think what is my request that we can have uh, maybe uh, uh, after 15 days or i think on sunday one 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 hour if somebody is free not very formal then we can have this discussion and uh, that will make us uh, geared up and uh, more and more learning process you can interaction is also more and uh, so, it's always better so uh, we can take take this liberty to pay back little bit to the to the alba meter and uh, uh, i don't um, i'm not seeing any question in the chat box also what is in the chat box so i think everybody is uh, nobody is asking any question so it's okay and uh, thanks a lot for sparing time on your busy sunday and uh, thanks all other friends dr ashish coming and joining Uh, with a uh, because of lots of interest listening in i mean I, i'm sure most of 
you only know all this it's just you know just no 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 i i had i i had, i learned so much uh, in from this and uh, i say it's uh, incorrect that we know most of the things but but uh, having said that we have to uh, we have to learn all these things we have to repeat repeat and repeat so that uh, everybody is uh, absolutely geared up and uh, thanks a lot once once again thank you thank dr shiva and you must remember 6 7 and 8th of august ah uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay thank okay. you thank you okay thank thanks you. a lot So if there is no other question dr Please. ashish can you can we close no okay yeah, sure thank you thank you thanks a lot thank you